So hello and welcome to another expert inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM from a lovely San Diego as usual. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Friedman Malik, who is in St. Gallen in Switzerland. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. How are you doing? Thank you for inviting me for this uh... Uh, collegial talk. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Dr. Malik is scientist, author, advisor, educator, and uh, chairman of the Management Center, St. Gallen, Switzerland, and Malik Institute for Complexity, Management, Governance, Governance, and Leadership. Friedman has written a number of books. And to be honest, this is one of those occasions where I can say I have read a number of those books. And we ourselves here at Pipeliner follow the uh, the Malik management uh, theory and uh, find that uh, it has transformed the way we do business. So it's uh, I'm excited to uh, to talk to you today. So what I wanted to talk about is uh, this concept of syntegration or super syntegration. And first of all, maybe for everybody here, uh, maybe if you can just define or explain what syntegration is. Did you say, uh, to make something clear, you did really read the books or you didn't? Oh, I did. Yes, yes. You did? Okay. Yeah. Thank you yeah, so no, I could, no, I did. Uh, I, I read the books. Um, in fact, you know, we, 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 followed the, we followed the management theory here at, right. uh, at Pipeliner. Okay, okay. Well, syntegration is... Um, I, an artificial, uh, it's a creation of words, uh, combining two words, name is syn uh, synergy and integration. So, syntegration. And what it actually means is bringing together quite a number, a big number, a large number of people to join in, in a highly harmonious symphony, one could al almost say, in order to interconnect their knowledges from very many fields, creating something as a rule totally new to a leading question, which is important, has been selected uh, by the board or whatever authority in their organizations to be of utmost importance. Mm -hmm. so, so this concept, I think, um, becomes even more exciting when you think about that organizations are are, are no longer they're no longer rest, restricted or or homogenous or even one dimensional because they can now have a mixture of like full time employees, part timers, contractors, some office space, some remote, spread around the world. So this idea of bringing all these skill sets together, it's almost like it's time has arrived because now you don't have the restrictions on getting to the expertise you need. Yes, that is true. Uh... And uh, it depends, of course, or it is it, it follows from the technological breakthroughs we have done in the last uh, couple of decades uh, by the use of cybernetics, of computer technology, of uh, modern information and communication technology, which follow from these sciences. And so at the first time in the, let me say, in the practice of management, actually, which is uh, very uh, old one actually because people have al always had to manage their uh, their destinies and their daily life uh, but for the first time we are equipped with totally different technologies we have not so far at least uh, broadly speaking followed up with the organizational setups which is needed so you have painted a very very colored and uh, good uh, picture of all those combinations of things which were quite a couple of years unthinkable. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's funny that you should say that about the organizations uh, not catching up because it's, it's quite ironic and I, and I find this all the time is you see companies who have disruptive or innovative business models or, or products or services and they're highly creative innovative companies but when they make the breakthrough, they then create very, very traditional hierarchical companies. They bring people together and they build offices and they adopt extremely traditional models, which seems almost at odds with their disruptive you know, business models or, or breakthrough technologies. Um, 
So, uh, so how do companies start to catch up? Because that's that obviously is going to impact at some stage the way you operate. In our case, I mean, practically all of these or most of these uh, startup companies start with technology, mm -hmm. some sort of digitalization. Of course, that's very understandable. Uh, these are the young people who are become very familiar in their at their university years or whatever, even as amateurs. But we did it the other way around, just by accident, basically. We started with the organizational setup. We uh, wanted to know how would organizations look like if we, if we looked at them or tried to understand them as living organisms. For mm -hmm. This is a metaphor, a picture which will help many. So interconnected systems, organizationally, people, and all the departments and whatever we have, and this is an offspring of cybernetics too. So I would like then to mention yes. a, a little bit the, the fact that my kind of management is a twin brother to digitalization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and as I said, I mean, we, we follow your management theories here and have found them to be extremely uh, effective in, in how it helps us operate a, as an organization. Uh, so how much does um, this change, this um, access to talent uh, across the globe and in, in different modes, as I said, you can have full-time employee contracts, you can scale your business now with a lot of variable uh, resources because you've access, access to them. That's going to change um, the balance of power somewhat because in, in past times, it's like you have companies, maybe you have like Silicon Valley and it's all concentrated there and that's where people need to be and that's the balance. But now we have the potential for some kind of sort of global democratization of resources, right? Absolutely, and it's uh, done. It's it's worldwide uh, possible. Basically, let us uh, put away for a moment uh, political uh, sure. aspects, uh, difficulties between different countries, China, the U.S., etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are still some barriers, but uh, even they become very, very. Um, they become penetrated by technology, basically, and by what technology transports. Uh, uh, and interconnects these days, namely intelligence, uh, by the way of information and communication in totally new formats. Yeah, and obviously uh, with the digital, with the with the spread of broadband, and now the promise of five G, uh, the the ability for people, as you say, across the globe to be able to contribute to the to to um, the digital world is is going to grow exponentially, right? Absolutely, and what grows the fastest is complexity. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me let me point to the fact that for the first time in history, due to technology, I mean, uh, what I should say first is that it is not digitalization or digitization, uh, however one uh, pronounces it, uh, in particular in your country. Uh, that is not really new. We have. Mm -hmm put idle the last analog computer in the 1970s or so. So that's not really new. And we had already a big, big company by the name of Digital Equipment. You might remember sure. that. Mm -hmm. uh, and his uh, very, very famous founder, Ken Olsen, at that time. The thing is, or the point is, what does digitization really allow us to do? And this is, for the first time in history, <clears throat> we can interconnect everything to everything else globally. And this will sort be sort of, a, of an omega state, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And this is the power which is already working in nature, but in evolution, by bringing up totally new things, creativity, amplification of intelligence, combining interconnecting everything with everything else, basically globally. It will last a few years. Uh, until we, we achieve that state, really. But the technology is there, and the examples are there. And this means that, I mean, the driving forces... You interrupt me, please. Uh, no, no, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. The driving forces are, of course, these technologies, 
but it's not only the computer side, it's only the biological, it's also the biological ones. So the biosciences become very, very important with the help of the computers. And uh, this is one driving force. Another one is um, uh, the demography. I mean, in, we have a lot of demographic uh, issues mm -hmm. sure. and challenges. Another one is uh, ecology, uh, of course, and the, the ecosystems become uh, all the more important. And then we have also the indebtedness, uh, the economic situation at now. But the strongest driver, the most powerful driver is, in my opinion, complexity. What comes out of interconnectivity is what we call complexity. And many people shy away from it and they want to reduce complexity. On the other hand, some, some things have to be reduced probably and in some instances it is okay so. But on the other hand, our brains are the most complex uh, apparatus, so to speak, organs where some 10 hundred billions, it's hundred billions of of nerve cells are interconnected in so and so many trillions of time. And this is the basis of our intelligence and our knowledge and even our emotions. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting that you talk about um, the, the complexity because obviously, yes, when you get this global democratization, etc., then it, uh, it, it does become more complex to manage all of this. Um, but at the same time, um, you have mentioned um, cybernetics a couple of times and you've said, um, you know, about complexity. So we, we also adopt cybernetic principles in our, in our products. So how does cybernetics play into this whole um, scenario? Uh, cybernetics is what holds systems together. So uh, it is the uh, capacity of self-organization, it brings in the capacity to self-regulating system, uh, to uh, amplification of intelligence, for instance, by, uh, again, uh, interconnecting uh, parts of uh, knowledge, knowledges which are apart so far. But if we interconnect them, then there is a huge outbreak of uh, creativity, for instance, amplification of, uh, uh, of intelligence, I already mentioned, unfreezing of knowledge which is otherwise stuck in the silos of the conventional organization and this gives us an enormous amount of uh, of uh, freedom also in the emotional sphere basically because with the very methodology of disintegration which you mentioned at mm -hmm. the very start uh, of our conversation uh, we can set free uh, the emotions of people in a way which was never even thinkable before. Yeah, and so and, and so getting back to what we're also talking about, so this raises huge challenges then for organizations in how to restructure themselves to be able to take advantage of all of this. And as I said earlier, even the most innovative companies tend to default to very traditional modes of operating and, and, and the structure and organization. So now organizations are going to have to become more creative in how they organize themselves, correct? Exactly. They become brain-like and we actually and explicitly are using, together with the integrational methodologies, the model of viable systems, as we call it. And this is uh, a model actually of the human nervous system, which belongs to the most uh, complex, but very well functioning systems. And this is our, our uh, let me say, our model we are following because it works so well and we are all familiar with it, or at least partly so. And so we are building organizations after that particular model and uh, using integration, as I already called, but then there are totally new kinds of strategy, for mm -hmm. instance. And you mentioned the word, the concept of effectiveness at the very beginning. Yeah. We are after what we call a culture of effectiveness. So cultures may have many, many different formats, and uh, one needs several of them, of course, uh, but uh, one thing is how to make all these things effective in the rising complexity of the various parts of the world. And this is still 
uh, or has been so far an unsolved problem, but uh, we are very close to it. Yeah, uh, because as I said, um, you know, having read your books and, and adopted your management um, theories, you know, focus on the results and effectiveness and um, you're obviously key to that. And I do feel sometimes you see, and there's a danger here as well as with these organizations that the the journey becomes the focus as opposed to the outcome. Yes, you are very, that's a very good <laughs> picture you are, you, are, you are painting. So with the tools and the, of course, sciences we are using, we can speed up the working of organizations by, think about it, <laughs> by a factor of 60 to 100. Not just six percent or ten percent, which would already be a lot of, yeah. but a factor of times sixty to hundred, creating the strong will by people to really change and make use of all these things, unfreezing the emotions, and by the way, the good as opposed to the bad emotions yeah. that are there, and in many organizations, I would say almost in. in in almost all of them, uh, quite the problematic emotions are predominating um, uh, instead of the other ones. Creating a strong will to change, I said already so, by using these methods, these social technologies, uh, strongly based on the cybernetic principles. Mm -hmm. And so, um, what, so when you talk to organizations, uh, and you do a lot of work with, with big organizations, um, what are some of the obstacles or, or the resistance you see to this kind of breakthrough thinking? I mean, there are quite a number of persons who just cannot imagine it. Mm -hmm. see, so it is uh, strange. It is like uh, science fiction and things like that. And in a way, yes, uh, up uh, or... or uh, until let me say three, four, five years ago, or ten, make it ten years ago, it was already. One could dream about it, and now it is at least becoming reality. And we have already applied that for almost one thousand times, and it never failed. And not only that, but it performed so excellently that the satisfaction uh, rankings are between ninety and one hundred on a scale of one hundred, and this. Uh, astonishes uh, people and in particular also uh, those uh, ladies and gentlemen in the top ranks because they are suffering from the organizational obstacles too. There are so many highly talented persons up there but then how can they really master and move let me say a company with 400,000 people, or mm -hmm. make it 40,000, even that is a very complex organization. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and obviously, you know, that's, that's why the temptation then just to put in hierarchies and put in lots and lots of layers of middle management comes in. But th that model doesn't really work when you're bringing, like with, with integration, when you're bringing talent together for projects or to solve problems or whatever, those models start to break down. So, yeah, so it is. And uh, partly we can uh, compare it, let me say, to a symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. I don't know whom of uh, our listeners um, love uh, classical music, but uh, on the other hand, if they love jazz, for instance, it is about the same thing. Mm -hmm. How people can harmoniously work together, play together. Uh, there is a, a, yes, there is a melody on that the basic, but then you can improvise around it. And it always comes together to give something better, which is more than just the sum of its parts. And a uh, symphony, some may like better classical music than they can imagine what it actually means. But then we go very much beyond the number of people uh, who constitute the symphony orchestra. We can amplify that, we can proliferate that kind of interplay and interchange. Yeah, so it's it, it definitely has. Uh, I mean, the division. I think for anyone listening, I mean, it it uh, it's a very exciting one, as I said, where you can bring together all of these different skill sets and creative minds and problem solving, bring them all together and source them to solve 
problems and and to you know uh, achieve the results that you're looking for but as we said it raises some challenges for people who have very traditional ways of thinking when it comes to to organizational culture so what would you in 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 the last few minutes here um Friedman what are some of the things how would you advise organizations to start this process or to at least start examining whether they should be uh, looking at an evolution of how they operate. There are very, there are several points to start with. One is, for instance, to consider just as if it, just to compare the organization with a living organism. I do not say that organizations as we have them are living organisms, but anyway, they are populated by living yeah. organisms. So there, there is a well, certain potential. At least for now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there is a, a certain comparability, let me put it like that. And then if we let our ideas flow and say, let us assume our company could be a living organism, what should we have to do? I do not say that organizations already are like the, mm -hmm. or, uh, living organisms, but we can... We can think about that, see? And then there come up a lot of, uh, of uh, creative ideas to start with. That is one thing. Another one, if uh, one expands on that idea, you come to the ecosystem. So the word ecosystem become, uh, these are the natural uh, interconnected kinds of uh, populations, plants, animals, whatever. So this is another good picture, which is very attractive to uh, quite a number of uh, persons. Another one, we have already basically some of these cybernetic organizations. So for instance, the regulation of the international air traffic, air traffic control, mm -hmm. we have <laughs> some 200,000 flights every day, day mm -hmm. and night around the globe in every weather condition and practically nothing happened. So there are already some such instances and examples which one can study. And then it flows quite um, by itself, you see. So right. the fantasy of people is already stimulated and ignited and they like these kinds of ideas. And in particular, not all of them, see, but enough of them on the highest ranks because they see they they get an idea of how to unleash the potential which is let me say below them in the organizational echelons which are badly badly needed and they know that they are needed yeah and 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 beyond the organization as we said now with the access to all of these uh resources across the globe that can be brought in where you can bring in specialists for a time uh, you know in a way that you never could before um well uh, this and Friedman this has been a this has been a fascinating conversation and I think we could go on for for a lot longer we're sc we're scratching the surface um but I wanted to I wanted to thank you for your time today also wanted to thank you for for your work, as I said, we have adopted it here, and it's made uh, it's made a big difference to us. So I would uh, really encourage uh, people who are watching or listening to go and uh, uh, check out uh, Professor Malik's work, his management theories, and his his other books, because I think you're going to find that they're quite transfer transformative. Um, so again, I just wanted to thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, John. It was a pleasure to talk to you and thank you for your wonderful questions and this stimulating conversation. Yeah. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.